Welcome, Dr. Anker. We're so excited uh, to have you present your findings of the reshape heart failure trial at ESC. And uh, Jack is very proud to um, be uh, one of the journals that's uh, late breaking some of those findings. So congratulations. I think uh, this is a great feat and I'd love to hear from you what that experience has been for you completing the trial and how does it feel now that you're about to uh, break the news to the world? Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. First of all, thank you so much personally also for having dealt with our uh, paper so diligently and, and so so fast also. Uh, and really, it was a very good publication experience, I must say. Uh, well, basically, it feels very good, uh, and particularly when you have some good news to spread and some important medical news to spread to the world. Uh, it took quite a long to do this investigator-initiated study. Uh, the, the legal sponsor is a university. The financial support came from Abbott, that's clear. Uh, we are using here um, an M-tier uh, kind of treatment uh, approach that is the MitraClip, uh, interestingly, in several generations. Uh, so the results you're seeing here are the combined results of uh, using this uh, technique over the last eight years, if you like, for inclusion of patients uh, with, you, with together with the follow-up of patients it's almost nine years uh, that it, it took us uh, to complete the study from first time uh, that the first patient had a first visit. The uh, study uh, is investigator-led, and I, I have the real privilege here to work with many good colleagues that are also co-authors, of course, and that's why you see so many co-authors uh, of the paper. And uh, we have a core lab for echocardiography, Stefan von Badeleben, uh, really did an excellent job there, very fast responses. Uh, and he is one of the few real echo experts who's an interventionalist at the same time. So there is really practical help that also the sites received from him, particularly in the early phase uh, of the study. Because being an investigator-initiated study, doing the trial in places where at the time not so many microclips were used, Right. Uh, we demanded that uh, the sites doing this had at least 10 clips before they came into the study. So some degree of a learning experience, but 10 is not very many. And so there was maybe still some learning also early on in the study and having such an experienced colleague then advising uh, all the sites uh, is really helpful. And the second thing is helpful. We don't have 100 sites like our other trials but we had only 30 sites in nine countries. So right. the, the number of patients per site yeah. is relatively high. Between 10 and 20 is the median number uh, kind of for inclusion. So that gives a minimum experience. Um, and this is this is helpful as well. That now, is, I agree. Because we, as we know, uh, the outcomes of MTR really depend on your procedural result. Uh, what the residual MR was or what the gradient was. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and what is also interesting, of course, is, and we don't have this yet, so even if you would ask, uh, have I seen any such results? I don't. But we have three or four uh, generations of clips used in the study. And so over time, we will actually be able, when once we are getting to all these analysis, to have uh, information how... Uh, over time, using different clips in different patients compared to the controls of the contemporary kind of time, uh, how this actually made a difference overall, that shall be very interesting. Very few studies have been able to do this in, in a meaningful way. So, so that should be very interesting future to come. So, so I'm happy about the results, but I'm also happy about the opportunities that come here from this uh, important database. Agree. So, Dr. Anker, what are the top line results of reshape heart failure uh, to summarize for our audience? Yeah, thank you. Well, basically, we had three primary endpoints, mm -hmm. and all of them worked in a statistically significant but also clinically meaningful way. The first uh, of these endpoints was the cardiovascular mortality plus all the first and recurrent heart failure hospitalization as a, a recurrent events analysis. Uh, and this was 36% reduced uh, p-value 0 0.002. With the same p-value and a 41% reduction, also all the recurrent heart failure hospitalizations were reduced. And then lastly, 
uh, as the third primary endpoint, the overall summary score of the uh, Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire also was improved by quite a lot, 11 points difference between the treatment groups. So three very significant results. And they are accompanied by some secondary outcome uh, results that are positive, uh, improving the MR function. This is not a surprise, but it's good to document. Improving New York heart class highly significantly, uh, and then also uh, increasing the six month walk test result by 21 meters. That's great. So, um, like we know that, you know, the COAPT and the MITRA FR trials were the ones that really set the stage for usage of uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair for the mitral valve in secondary MR. Uh, but um, as you're aware, the findings were conflicting and there was so much debate about what can explain the differences. And uh, reshape heart failure to do you think now this is a tiebreaker? It is uh, additional information that will, in my opinion, shift the balance of uh, the totality of evidence very much uh, in favor of using this in a spectrum of patients that is not only severe functional MR, but also uh, moderate, uh, or at least the more sicker end of the moderate and the moderate to severe patients. Uh, because if you take, for instance, the EROA average in our trial was only 0.23. Mm -hmm. So they are, they are really not uh, in the majority the severe patients, but the majority is the moderate and the moderate to severe patients included in our study. Uh, the mortality at one year in the control group is not 23% like it was in co-op and in mitravar, but it's only 14% which is one of the reasons that we really were not powered to show all-cause mortality differences in our trial with 500 patients. Uh, the mortality is lower. Of course, we collected overall more than 250 uh, fatal events, but over a period of uh, like five years, and the average follow-up for mortality was about three and a half to four years, um, we did not achieve a significant mortality reduction, but all the other things very positive and particularly up to 24 months, where by, by our ethics committee restrictions, we had basically the ability to look at serious adverse events and to look at hospitalizations in detail. That's basically where we have all the benefit. Perfect. You know, one of the things that perplexed me a little while handling the paper was that on the one hand, the severity of MR was a little less than the previous trials. But on the other, if we looked at their KCCQ scores and hospitalization rates and NYHA class, then they seemed to be more symptomatic. So uh, is that is that correct on my end to uh, to think about the data in that fashion? And if yes, how do you explain how do you explain that that they're less MR, more symptomatic? Well, and they do get benefits. Very, but, yeah, yeah. Well, but the, your observation is absolutely correct. But the association is, is maybe not there. I, I, nobody should start to say more milder, if like FMR, is related automatically uh, to a worse quality of life. It's slightly different. Your milder FMR must come with a poor quality of life to be considered for mitroclip. Makes sense. And, and so the, the physicians wouldn't even dare to suggest to a more milder, moderate, if you like, moderate and moderate to severe FMR patient such an intervention if the patient wouldn't be rather very sick. And, and so, so it's not really that the, the, there is a direct relationship, but it's a selection bias issue, I think. Makes sense. And, um, you know, obviously, um, we are going to try to put all three trials in context, right? And um, I think there was this discussion after COAPT and MITRAFR that maybe COAPT patients were more quote unquote disproportionate MR as in much more MR compared to the LV chamber size and MITRAFR dilated LVs um, and proportionate MR. And so maybe the LVs are so dilated out there that it's uh, too late in the stage of remodeling. So <clears throat> Dr. Anker, how, does this, how has this trial changed your practice? Do you, um, how do you view your secondary MR patients now when you see them in clinic? 
Uh, I think uh, in my practice, in the practice in Europe, and I spoke already to a number of colleagues who have seen the results and how they, they respond, more patients will receive interventions, clearly. Uh, and um, this this will make uh, uh, the, the the minds of physicians much more open. Also, when the patient is, shall we say, only symptomatic, but technically not yet in severe FMR by, by numbers. And let's not forget, uh, and this is a discussion I had uh, both with Jack and the New England Journal editors and reviewers uh, in the last six weeks quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, these cut points for uh, what is called uh, two plus, three plus, and four plus. In the papers, it looks really easy when you look at the, shall we say, quasi guideline uh, kind of consensus definitions. Mm -hmm. But these uh, definitions, uh, there is there's two problems with them. Number one, they are made on uh, 2D images and not on 3D images. So the moving image might look different to the echocardiography expert than uh, the cut point that you are able to document and measure for this specific patient. That's the first point. The second point is it's actually a uh, transtorical echo that is used for these uh, thresholds. But if you have available uh, a transesophageal echo, there is actually, to my knowledge, no consensus exactly on the cut points there. But our core lab, and this is one of the reasons why there is this this uh, surprise. We, on the one hand, only included three plus and four plus patients, but still we get the numbers lower than in the other trials, right. because in many many cases our core lab had also available the uh, the three D images uh, and and and, and oh, the yeah. and the moving images from uh, the trans esophageal echo. I see. I think and that so, makes a lot of difference. And and so I, I just spoke actually uh, yesterday again or today in the morning with Stefan von Baderleben exactly about this point. This actually makes makes a difference to the overall judgment. And, and so um, I, I have become more humble with regards to, to these cut points, to be honest. That makes sense. Um, and I think maybe one of the takeaways is also that for patients who are on borderline of moderate or severe MR to, 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 to pursue a TEE imaging to really understand the severity. And that is what we do in our practice as well. So uh, that does make a lot of sense. And many times the TEE will really show you uh, the real severity that you would not have appreciated on transthoracic. Yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Anke, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure and uh, best of luck uh, for uh, the ESC presentation. And uh, we're looking forward to everything that comes after. We'll actually also do a journal club um, with you. Jack is launching the series of journal clubs. Okay. Um, and one of the big ones you want to do is reshape. Uh, and we'll invite you for that as well. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for okay. having me. Thank you too. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.